Greetings, this is N1IR, and uh, today we're going to go over the Technician PowerPoint slides for the Technician License class. This is the uh, first section, T1A through T1F. This is the new uh, 2014 to uh, 2018 um, validity dates for the uh, license. So let's go ahead and start. So part of the amateur radio is advancing skills in the technical and communication phases of radio art is one of the purpose clearly spelling out in the FCC rules. So as part of the amateur community, we advance in our technical and communication skills. Uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, makes the enforces all amateur rules in the United States. Part 97 is the FCC regulation containing the rules governing amateur radio service. And uh, there's a, a snapshot of it on the uh, right hand side. It's a big uh, three ring binder, about an uh, inch and a half uh, thick. It's uh, quite a bit of rules. Do you have to memorize all the rules? Uh, no, you do not. That's why uh, you can download them off the web and uh, take a look at them. But, uh, anyways, uh, this is T1A transmissions that are seriously degrades and obstruct repeated repeatedly interrupts a radio communication services operation in accordance with the radio regulation meet by the FCC definition as harmful interference. So, as part of the uh, amateur radio, you cannot um, have any type of harmful interference or cause harmful interference to existing uh, stations, like if the FM dial or TV or GSM or any of that. Uh, locally in my area, down at Cape Cod, uh, we have a 70 centimeter uh, restriction uh, for our area because we're a secondary user, which I'm going to get into in a little bit uh, on the later slides. Um, we can't uh, operate on those frequencies over a certain power limit within a certain range of the radar facility. So that would be uh, harmful interference if we did do that. So part of the amateur radio, uh, we don't want to cause any harmful interference to any other services other than ourselves. Uh, one purpose of amateur radio service defined by the FCC rules and regulation is to enhance the international goodwill. And uh, a lot of things that we do on the HF, you're, you're communicating with um, other countries around the world, and it's, uh, it's just part of goodwill. We communicate back and forth um, to various countries. Radio navigation services are protected from interference by amateur radio signals under all circumstances. So radio navigation such as GPS, LoRan, um, any type of those systems, especially around 160 meter, which is around 1.8 megahertz, um, we don't want to interfere with any of that. Um, the FCC Part 97 definition of telemetry is a one-way transmission of measurements at a distance from the measuring instrument. So telemet telemetry is one-way transmission. That's all you have to remember for that question. The frequency coordinator recommends that the transmit and receive channels and other parameters for auxiliary and repeater stations. So in the amateur radio we have repeaters and um, they're all coordinated by a central authority. Uh, it's usually a few volunteers that uh, will coordinate uh, repeaters in a certain area and they just want to make sure that the repeaters don't uh, uh, accidentally have harmful interference with each other. Uh, frequency coordinators are selected by amateur radio operators in the local or regional areas whose stations are eligible to be auxiliary or repeater stations. So that's a little bit about frequency coordinators. And again, they're, they're volunteers. Uh, per FCC Part 97 definition, your ham station will consist of a radio equipment that will be used for amateur radio communications. So what they what they're saying is your ham equipment is under part 97. If you have other equipment like marine radio, citizens band, um, GMRS, anything like that, that's under a different part uh, rules and regulations for the FCC. But all the amateur radio stuff is all under part 97. With your license expired and during the grace period, you're not to permit to transmit until the FCC license database shows that your license has been renewed. So if your um, amateur radio license happens to lapse, you have a two-year grace period to renew it. But during that two-year grace period, you're not supposed to transmit. 
and updating your license is very easy with the ULS database from the FCC. It takes only a few seconds. Uh, allowing a person to conduct radio experiments and to do communicate with other licensed ham around the world qualifies as permissible use of amateur radio activity. Now, this is a big thing with amateur radio. We like to experiment with different modes, different modulation types, different frequencies, and we could do that. Um, that's the whole point of amateur radio. The FCC Part 97 definition of telecommand is a one-way transmission to initiate, modify, or terminate functions of a device at a distance. So for telecommand, if we're telecommand for a satellite, for instance, uh, it's one-way transmission, and we can initiate, turn it on, modify, or shut it off at a distance. If you're interfering with a uh, radio location station outside the U.S. on a 23 centimeter band, stop operating and take steps to eliminate the harmful interference. So radio location, again, GPS systems, they're around that uh, frequency range. Um, if you do cause harmful interference, it's really easy to stop operating, take steps to eliminate, move frequencies, uh, put filters on, etc. There's a whole ton of things that you can do to uh, to eliminate harmful interference to that. Uh, generally, the FCC will pretty much let you do anything on your frequencies, on the amateur frequencies, as long as you don't interfere. The whole thing with them is interference with other, other systems that are already in use. Uh, the ITU is a worldwide United Nations agency for information and communication technology issues. So they're the guys who bring up this map here. They break up the uh, world into different regions. Uh, if you're in America, in the U.S., uh, we're in Region 2. Uh, Europe, par uh, Africa, parts of Asia is Region 1. And uh, Region 3 is Australia, uh, Japan, and that area. So each region has a set of rules and regulations as well, and a set of frequencies that they can use. U.S. territories in different ITU regions can cause frequency assignments different from the 50 states. So if you, um, so 52.525 megahertz is within the 6 meter band. So here's the 6 meter band. Here's a, uh, a diagram of it ranges anywhere from uh, 50 megahertz all the way up to 54, and it's broken up into various things uh, with repeaters, with CW, satellite, uh, simplex repeaters, etc. 146.52 is within the 2 meter band, and that happens to be the national calling frequency for 2 meters, which is a simplex frequency. So here's the 2 meter chart. The 2 meter goes from 144 to 148 megahertz. And it has a variety of, um, of, of um, transmission types in there. You can do single sideband. You can do FM simplex. You can do FM repeaters. Uh, you can do remote control systems, uh, digital systems, etc. Okay, 443.350 megahertz is the authorized frequency to a technician class license holder in IT region 2 on the 70 centimeter band. Now this is for Region 2. If you go to Region 1 or Region 3, uh, it's going to be a little bit different. But all you have to remember is Region 2 because you're in North America, you're going to be operating in Region 2. So uh, here's the 440 band, the 70 centimeter band. Um, notice there's a note up here, 420 to 430 is not available on Canadian corridor. Uh, that's to do with uh, some radar facilities up in that area, so you want you want to where I was called a secondary user on this center centimeter. The primary user on that band is the military and their radar facilities. Again, uh, my location down in the Cape Cod, uh, we have something called Pave Pause, which is an early warning uh, radar system, and they operate within those frequencies, and they, they told us not to operate um, as a secondary user within 25 miles of that facility. So. Uh, we comply with that so we don't ha create harmful interference for them, and, uh, and they're all happy with that. So, anyways, uh, 1296 megahertz is a frequency on the 23 centimeter band is authorized. Okay, here's the 23, 23 centimeter band, which is 1.2 uh, gigahertz. And we have a variety of things up there. We've got satellite, we've got television, we've got uh, FM. 
um, voice data, remote control systems, a whole bunch of stuff up there. Um, when transmitting on 223.50, you're using the 1.25 meter band, the one and a quarter meter band. Now, the one and a quarter meter band is a real interesting band. It kind of has the properties of two meter band and the 70 centimeter band, or 440 megahertz band. And um, North America is the only one that has this band. Uh, any other uh, region doesn't have this band available to them. And um, this is a very interesting band that some of this bandwidth, we originally went down to 220 megahertz. So from 220 to uh, 222 uh, is, is currently taken up by a um, uh, delivery service routes and uh, it's telemetry data. So we're not allowed on that uh, frequencies anymore. But we are allowed from 222 up to 225. And uh, that has a variety of uh, things in there. We have repeaters, we have FM simplex, and we have voice and data. Uh, whether the amateur service is secondary in some portions of the 100 centimeter band in the U.S., amateurs may find a non-amateur station in the band and must avoid interfering with them. So if you hear something on the 70 centimeter band, um, just kind of avoid it. Don't transmit over them. We have plenty of other frequencies to operate on. Uh, just move. You know, so that's part of that rule there. Uh, it's not good practice to set your transmit frequency to be exactly on the edge of the amateur band or subband. And that is because we have calibration error in the transmit frequency display. We can be off of by a few hertz. Uh, modulation side bands can extend beyond band edge. So if you're on the upper limit on the band edge, and let's say you're on upper side band, you're going to be transmitting uh, over that edge, and you don't want that. Same thing with lower. If you're on the lower side of the band and you're on lower side band, you're going to the side carrier is going to be below where you're supposed to be. Allow for transmitter for frequency drift. This is especially true for older uh, radios with um, tube equipment. And uh, all these choices are correct. So calibration error on the modulation side bands can extend beyond the band edge and your, your transmitter can drift. The three bands about 30 megahertz available to the technician class operator. The six meter, two meter, one and a quarter meter. Each band has a mode restricted subband. And what that means is that there's certain sections of the band that has Morse code, CW, certain sections that have a uh, single sideband, and certain sections that have just satellite. So CW is the only emission mode permitted in the mode restricted subbands of 50 to 50.1 megahertz and 144 to 144.1 megahertz. So on the lower portion of the band from 50 to 50.1 and from 144 to 144.1. Amateur operating frequencies are not the same everywhere in the world, and they vary among the three ITU regions. So whatever whatever's uh, common up here, ITU region 2, is going to be different ITU region uh, 2 and 3. Data emissions may be used between 219 and 220 megahertz. Okay, special event call signs having a single letter on both the prefix and suffix. So in the amateur radio, we have call signs. So uh, mine, for example, is N1IR. I have a single letter, a number, and then two letters after that. For special events, you can request uh, what's called a one-by-one -one call sign, which would be a letter, a number, a letter. So K1C or N1R or anything like that. But it's just for special events. Ham radio call signs in the United States begins with the letter A, K, N, or W. They also have a single number 0 through 9, depending on the region where you are licensed. So W3ABC, K3DIO, WB5QNG are all valid call signs. Communications incidental with the purpose of amateur services are in remarks of personal character and types of international communications are permitted by the FCC licensed amateur station. Okay. U.S. amateurs are allowed to operate their amateur station in a foreign country where the foreign country authorizes it. So, if you're in a cruise ship, for example, um, 
I've operated from a cruise ship before and you have to request uh, permission from the foreign country that operates the ship and then you have to get permission from the captain and you should do this way ahead of um, your vacation or wherever you're staying because it takes quite a bit of long time uh, to get uh, authorization to operate in that country. It usually takes anywhere from two to three months. But um, anyways, K, K1 XXX is an example of a technician class licensee vanity call. So if we take a look at this call uh, sign right here, K3DIO, this is a vanity plate. And if you're in Massachusetts like I am, they actually charge you an extra $35 just for that plate. that has the little lightning bolt symbol. Um, so, but a lot of other states, uh, as long as you present your license, it's, it's normally free. Um, but I know Massachusetts, they charge 35 bucks for some strange reason. I don't know why. FCC licensed amateur stations may transmit from vessel or craft located in international waters and documented or registered in the United States in addition to places where the FCC regulates communications. So you can actually transmit on a boat uh, in international waters as long as the boat is registered in the United States. So uh, if you're into sailing or um, on a boat beyond um, our borders, you can still communicate to people in the U.S. The vocation of the station license or suspension of the operator license is possible when correspondence from the FCC is returned as an undeliverable because the grantee failed to provide the correct mailing address. This is this is really 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 important. The FCC has to be able to contact you by mail. So you're, you have to have your current mailing address in what's called the ULS, which is their database. Um, you have to have your current address there at all times. If they can't contact you, they're going to revoke your license. Um, that's the only way they communicate to you is by mail. They don't really do anything by email or by phone or anything else. They have to contact you by mail. So here is one thing, special counsel in the FCC Spectrum Enforcement Division, Raleigh Hollingsworth, wrote Larry L. Smith, KC7L Je uh, Juliet Romeo of Middleton, Idaho, and Larry uh, Vantag, KD7JTG of Patterson, Arizona, to inform them that the FCC was suspending their technician tickets for the remainder of their license term or until each licensee provides a valid mailing address. So that's what's going to happen is they'll, they'll revoke your license until you provide them an, an accurate mailing address. So that's really, really, really important. So the amateur station is granted for a term of 10 years. So here's an example of a radio station license. Here's the call sign, who it is, and the grant date, effective date, and the expiration date. Now, after that 10 years, all you have to do is renew. You do not have to take over the test. Um, so you can keep renewing it, keep renewing it, keep renewing it. Um, there is no cost to renew if you're using a uh, issued call sign. If you have a vanity call sign like myself, it's, I forget how much it is, it's, uh, I think it's like 8 or $10 um, for that 10 years. It's, it's very, very little amount of money um, for a vanity call so um, but you got to renew it every 10 years and renewing is extremely easy it takes like about 30 seconds on the ULS um, I've done it a couple times and it's taken me less than a couple minutes to, to renew uh, they won't let you renew until you're within about a month of your expiration date so that's that's another little thing uh, there's a two-year grace period to renew an expired license. So you, if you forget in that 10 years, you can, you can go over to uh, for a two-year grace period. But uh, you can't transmit in that period until you show up in the ULS database. After passing your examination for your license, as soon as you operate station license grant appears in the FCC license, you may operate on a year. Years ago, you used to have to have a paper copy of the license and post it. Um, that's no longer the case. The FCC has gone to an electronic format, which uses the, again, the ULS, the Universal Licensing System. And uh, as long as it shows up in there, you're good to operate, even before you get your paper license. 
uh, with your licenses expired and during the grace period, you're not permitted to transmit until the FCC license database shows that your license has been renewed. No transmitting during the two-period grace period. It's very important. Any licensed amateur can request a vanity call. Now, speaking of uh, grace periods and renewals, it takes a uh, very little amount of time. I, I, I believe it's under about a week now, or one week, uh, that you can, you can get a renewal in the mail um, and showing up on the OLS database uh, once you pass your test or if you renew or if you do any changes. It's very quick compared to many, many years ago. Um, back uh, 20, 20 years ago, it used to take you know two, anywhere from two to three months to get your license. Not the case anymore. It's uh, all electronic. It's very fast. Um, so you don't have to wait very long. So you don't have to, um, if, if you do ex get expire and uh, you do renew, you don't have to wait very long. It's only a couple days. Uh, any licensed amateur can request a vanity call sign. The FCC issues only three ham radio licenses. You got the technician, the general, and the amateur extra. Only the person named as a trustee on a club station license grant may select a vanity call for the club. So if you start up a club and you want a vanity call, uh, only the person that has is named the trustee can select a vanity call for the club. That's just to eliminate confusion. It's kind of common sense that one person's in charge of it. Any country whose administration notifies the ITU that the objective communications with the SEC licensed amateur stations result in prohibition from exchanging communication. So, an uh, example, good example would be North Korea, right? North Korea doesn't want anything to do with amateur radio. We had one amateur radio operator in there, they kicked them out, and they want nothing to do with the SEC. That's, so, that's an example of a country uh, that has notified the ITU they don't want to communicate. Okay, during Armed Forces Day communication test, the FCC licensed amateur station may exchange messages with U.S. military stations. Well, interesting fact. Uh, transmission of code ciphers that hide the meaning of the messages are allowed by amateur station only when transmitting control commands to a space station or radio control craft. So this is the only time you're re required to use code ciphers hide hiding message. Uh, is when you're controlling a space station or radio control craft. Any other time, if you're communicating over the repeater, if you're communicating over HF, um, you can't use codes of ciphers. And that makes kind of sense. You don't want anyone hijacking over a space station and crashing into the Earth or uh, accidentally uh, messing up your remote control craft and crashing it or whatnot. So, um, that's the only time you're allowed to use codes and ciphers in amateur radio. The only time an amateur radio station is authorized to transmit music is when it's incidental to authorize retransmission of manned spacecraft communications. So, for example, um, if there's a... Um, up at the International Space Station, they wake up the astronauts every morning with music. So, uh, we rebroadcast that over amateur radio frequencies on HF and that's incidental to that. So that's when it's um, allowed. Um, any other time music is not allowed. So that's the only time it's allowed is in, in that uh, specific situation. So amateur radio operators may use this station to notify other amateurs of availability of equipment for sale or trade when the equipment is normally used in an amateur station such activity is not conducted on a regular basis. So um, on some of the uh, nets that we have on the air, we have swap meets, and uh, people can sell their amateur ra related radio equipment uh, over the air. Um, now, normally, what they'll do is they'll, you know, they won't do prices or anything like that. They'll say, I have this unit for sale, contact me by email. That is perfectly fine as long as it's not done on a regular basis. Uh, transmission of language that may be considered incidental or obscene is prohibited. So this is the uh, uh, no naughty words, right? <laughs> Auxiliary repeater or space stations can automatically retransmit the signals of other amateur stations. OK. 
Okay, when the communication is incidental to the classroom instruction at an educational edu ed institution, the control operator of an amateur station may receive compensation for operating the station. This is the only time that you can be paid as an amateur radio operator. Any other time it's done as a voluntary basis. Now, um, I am a um, school teacher. I, I have ham radio in my classroom, and as an incidental, I, I do get paid for operating my station, which is fine. That, that's the only time that uh, you can be paid uh, as uh, an amateur radio operator. Assuming no other means is available, amateur stations are authorized to transmit signals related to broadcasting, program production, news gathering, only when such communications directly relate to immediate safety of human life or protection of property. So, um, One. Let's see. Transmitters, transmissions of attended by a reception to the general public is termed broadcasting the FCC rules services. So we're not allowed to broadcast. Unidentified transmissions are permitted when transmitting signals controlled to a model craft. So this is the only time that you, you don't identify yourself in a transmission is when you're uh, operating remote control RC. But um, you have to have a sticker on the remote with the call sign on it. Uh, all other unidentified transmissions are prohibited. So IDing takes a few seconds. You just say this is and when I are. If you're doing a test on a repeater, just say your call sign. I'm testing it out, uh, etc. Uh, amateur radio stations may engage in broadcasting when transmitted code practice information bulletins transmissions necessary to provide emergency communications. So if we're on a repeater and you want to transmit amateur radio news line, which is a, um, um, an information bulletin, we can do that. Or for transmitting code practice, or um, if we're transmitting in, uh, for emergency communications, we can broadcast uh, that way. Now broadcasting again, let me go back, is one-way communications. You're broadcasting. You're, you're, you're keying up the radio and you're just transmitting whatever your information that you have. And you're not, it's not two-way. So that's, that's the only way that uh, you're only allowed to broadcast information. Alright. So an amateur radio station is never permitted to transmit without a control operator. So uh, as a control operator, you got to be there to monitor the equipment. If something happens, shut it down, change the frequencies, whatever. Um, you got to be in control of the radio. The only person whom an amateur operator primary license grant appears in the SEC database or who is authorized for an alien reciprocal operation may be des designated to be the control operator of an amateur station. Ah, that's a mouthful. Okay, so basically saying that if you're licensed uh, or if you're authorized uh, from another country to come over here and you're authorized with a call sign you can transmit uh, it can be a control operator of an amateur station okay the station licensee must be designated to station control operator so uh, for example, you have a friend coming over and he wants to operate the radio. He is more than willing. I encourage it, but you have to be there next to him. Um, you can't leave them alone with the radio equipment. You've got to be there and ensure that everything is uh, operating properly and be able to shut down if, if uh, something happens. So the class of operator license uh, held by the control operator determines the transmitting privileges in an amateur station. So um, if I have a technician license, uh, I'm supposed to stay in the technician class license band. Uh, same thing with uh, extra and uh, general. However, if I go over to my friend's house and he happens to be a general or he happens to be an extra, I can operate on the general and extra frequencies, however, I have to use his call sign and he has to be there uh, right beside me. 
Okay, the location at which the control operator functions is performed as an amateur station control point. Now, automatic control is the type of control when operating an APRS network digipeters. Okay, the control operator and the station licensee are equally responsible for the proper operation of, all of the amateur station. So as the control operator and the station licensee, you're both equally re responsible. Okay, repeaters. Repeater operation is an example of automatic control. So a repeater repeats your signal. You transmit on one set of frequencies. The repeater receives it, retransmits on another set of frequencies to other radios. And a repeater is usually at a high location like a mountain or a hilltop or a large building and it extends your range. So uh, you can be as little as a couple of watts, get into a repeater, it'll retransmit your signal at a higher power, at a higher location, so you get further distance. Local control is the type of control being used when a control operator is at the control point. Operating the station over the internet is an example of remote control defined as part 97. Unless documentation contrary is in the station records, the SEC presumes that the station licensee is the control operator of the amateur station. Under normal cir circumstances, a technician class licensee at no time may be the control operator of a station operating an exclusive extra class operator segment of the amateur band. That was my example back a couple of slides ago. If you go over your friend's house and he's an extra, uh, you can use his call sign to operate in the extra class band. If you're using your call sign, you better be either in a technician, whatever class license that you have. Um, you can't go into the extra class. So that that's kind of um, common sense because the person on the other end of the radio is going to look up your call sign um, and see what type of license class you are, and he's going to determine if uh, if you're in the right band or not. So it's just a lot less confusion if you just use the person's um, that has a higher class license if you're operating on his equipment. But again, he has to be there sitting there next to you. We do that a lot in field day. We'll go. We'll have a technician operate in the uh, general and extra band as long as there's an extra guy, uh, extra class license person sitting next to him, he can operate on those bands. So he's actually the control operator. Okay, tactical call sign uh, is the type of ID when using the identify on the air, such as race headquarters. So we can use tactical call signs uh, such as road races, bike races, uh, providing support, stuff like that. We can do tactical call signs. However, uh, it's good practice to also identify with your call sign. Uh, at a community services net, use the tactical identifiers with the station FCC assigned call sign must be transmitted at the end of each communication and every 10 minutes during communications. So again, you can use your tactical call sign uh, and you got to identify yourself under your uh, license as well. Okay, so this keep saying every 10 minutes uh, at the end of your transmission. Again, when you're operating on the repeater or if you're operating HF, um, you're going to be identifying probably earlier than that. Uh, it's a simple habit that you have. Uh, the English language is an acceptable language for station identification when operating the phone subband. So, um, for example, New Bedford, um, I hear Portuguese back and forth. They can do that. Uh, that's perfectly fine. You can communicate in another language as long as you identify in English your call sign. So that's that's a nice little thing. So I can talk to someone in France. I can talk to them in French. I can do that all day long as long as I identify myself in English. Sending the call sign CW or phone emissions is a method of call sign identification required for station transmitting a phone signal. So I can transmit uh, my call sign either by voice or through my West code. Formats of a stroke slant or slash is format of self-assigned designators, uh, self-assigned indicators acceptable when using phone transmissions. When a non-licensed person speaks a foreign station using a station under control of a technician class control operator, the foreign station must be of one which the U.S. has a third-party agreement. 
So again, one of the big countries we don't communicate with, again, is North Korea, for example. Uh, we don't have a third-party agreement with them, but um, there's a whole list of um, countries we do have third-party agreements with. There's a lot of them out there. Um, I won't list them all, but uh, pretty much everyone, um, except for a couple of countries that, that uh, don't have third-party agreements. Indicators required by the FCC used after a station call signs are slash KT slash AE slash AG when using new licenses privileges earned by the CSCE while awaiting upgrades in the FCC license database. So as a technician, um, you upgrade to extra, you can, um, I'm sorry, if you upgrade to general, you can say your call sign slash AG when you're operating in a general um, uh, privilege area of the band. Uh, that's to indicate to the other person on the other side that you've just received your uh, general license and you're awaiting that upgrade to show up in the FCC license database. Um, again, it's only going to be a couple days. The the FCC is really, 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 really good lately in getting things uh, filed. So I would say you know a couple probably in a couple days that that upgrade will go through. Again, this was to bridge the gap for someone for operating this, so they wouldn't have to wait, you know, years ago they would have to wait months in order to see their upgrade. Um, so that's where the slash AG slash AE. So if you, uh, if if you're upgraded to general, you say slash AG. If you if you're upgraded to extra slash AE. A repeater station simultaneously retransmits the signal of another amateur station on a different channel or channels. Okay, for example, this is on a 70 centimeter. So station A transmits on 444.54 and receives on 449.54. Station B transmits on 444.54 and receives on 449.54. So when you transmit, you're transmitting to the repeater. The repeater is rebroadcasting that um, on. So when you when you transmit, it's transmitting on 444.54. The repeater receives that and retransmits on 449.54. And um, So that's on repeaters. The control operator of the origi or originating station is accountable. Should be should a repeater be inadvertently retransmit communication that violates the FCC rules? So, if you violate the FCC rules, it's the control operator uh, of the origin uh, of the original station um, that violates the FCC rules, not the repeater. Um, so the repeater just happens to, to retransmit the infraction, and uh, it's not the repeater's fault. It's the actual control operator that did the original transmitting. Uh, the FCC rules authorize the transmission of non-emergency communication with any station whose government permits such communications. Uh, at least four persons are required to be members of a club for a club station license issued by the FCC. FCC. So you only need four people to form a club to get a club call sign. The station licensee must make the station and its records available for FCC inspection upon request by the FCC representative. So if you get a knock on the door and by the FCC and they want to inspect your station, um, you got to let them in and inspect it. Um, so that's pretty much on uh, T1. And uh, we're going to go over the Q&A section in the next video. So if you tune into the next video, uh, we'll do the uh, Q&As.